Hi, I'm Rich Laveau. At Bloomfield College, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Young people recovering from addiction next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chess Challenge. Steve and Elaine Pozicki, Cone Resnick, Accounting Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Fedway Associates, University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, the Ollendorf Center, and by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, every day families lose a loved one to opiate addiction. But recovering from addiction is in fact possible. And here in the studio to discuss better understanding and supporting sobriety, we have Marielle Harrison, president of Young People in Recovery, the New Jersey chapter. She's been sober for eight years. Aaron Kucharski, advocacy coordinator for the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Dependence of New Jersey. Joel Pomalis is in long-term recovery. And finally, Pamela Capassi is Chief Executive Officer of Prevention Links. I want to thank you all for joining us. We're going to have a very honest and productive discussion about recovery. Um, Aaron, what don't we understand, the rest of us, about recovery? Yeah, well, first, thank Other you. Other than a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, th thank you for having us on the show. I think that um, it's common that people focus on the consequences of untreated addiction. That's the story that's out there. So it's refreshing uh, to see a conversation about the solution uh, is about recovery. I think one of the things that is often not understood, you know, people think about recovery, they think about stopping drinking and drugging. That's a piece to it, um, but it's a smaller piece. Uh, addiction is uh, a lifestyle, uh, uh, addiction is a chronic health condition that people recover from over time. So I think that the stopping drinking and drugging, drugging is the first piece to it, mm -hmm. um, but learning to live your life and maintain recovery is the bigger piece to all of it. But you know, as I was reading each one of your stories, as much as one can learn from a pre-interview with, <laughs> with our great producers who, who talked to you beforehand, I thought to myself, how much of your individual stories, A, do you want to share, B, is it necessary and useful for our audience to understand? What do you think? Because I said in your introduction that you were, you were sober for eight years, and I'm like, okay, is, important to, is it important for our audience to know what you were dealing with before that? Do you think it is? I think it's important to have like a snapshot. Well, give us a snapshot. Um, you know, and the snapshot of, of what it looked like for me before I entered in recovery sure. is, uh, is I was a daily drug user. I was a From when? Or is that beyond the snapshot? I'm happy to tell you. I don't know if it's beyond the snapshot, but it, I was a daily drug user from 17 to 21, okay. uh, a daily drinker from 17 to 21. And by the end, I was homeless. Uh, I didn't have a meaningful relationship in my life, and my life revolved specifically around alcohol and drug use. Uh, what I think is more important, though, is what recovery looks like and what recovery has given me, which is so many things. But um, I'm a full-time student. I'm a valuable employee. I'm an advocate for people whose voice can't be heard. Um, I'm also a daughter, a girlfriend, a sister, an aunt, a taxpayer, all of these things, um, which I think is a much more important snapshot because like Aaron said, we talk a lot about untreated addiction. And that picture of the 20-year-old girl that's homeless on the corner doing heroin is, is very visible. However, the picture of the 28-year-old girl who is paying taxes and showing up for life uh, is visible, but not under the guise of, of recovery and addiction. Well said. Um, snapshot. Well, my entire professional career has been um, allocated to working with young people who are struggling with addiction and their families. And so again, what's out there is the, are the statistics about the relapse rates and 
the dropout rates and the juvenile, you know, justice rates. Mm -hmm. um, so after a while, I thought, you know, we need to be looking at what we're providing our kids as far as treatment and support. Um, and the system. Why did you get into this? Why did I personally get into yeah. it? Yeah. I found it found me. I. <laughs> it found it you. It found me. So the re it did. Re recovery found you. It really did. You know, I was um, a single mother raising my kids, right. looking for a way to finish school. Well, I want to be clarify something. Unlike your situation and yours, and there's this, you are not recovering. I'm you, not. In you recovery. were never a user, and no. I mean, it's like myself, like many other people. I can list five people really close to me that are. I have family members, friends. But not you know, personally. But not for me you. personally. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No. It found you. It did find How? me. How? Um, well, I got out of a um, questionable marriage, <laughs> let's say, and I was looking for a way to finish school. And I started um, doing a cooperative education arrangement with an organization at the time I lived in Sussex County that you know served individuals in recovery mm -hmm. and struggling with addiction. and. What I found was that it resonated for me. I had enough of the family pieces that affect a person's life uh, going on in my life that, you know, the 12 steps and the model for uh, What recovery. resonated for you specifically? I want to understand that. Um, the, the, the patterns that addiction can have in a person's life. For example. <laughs> no, I mean, we, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm imagining a good part of our public broadcasting and FIOS audience does not understand. And so that's why I'm drilling mm -hmm. down a little bit. And, and feel free to jump in and help out. For example. There are some unhealthy boundaries that exist in a home so um, where everybody will try to accommodate at the or, or not even acknowledge. When you say accommodate, that's interesting. Yeah. Accommodate the person who is addicted using accommodate. Well, what does that mean, accommodate? I think it's really obvious that addiction affects a lot of people's lives. It's a shame-based condition where it's not common for people to, to talk about it outside of their families. Other than the person who's using. And family members, are, it's hard mm -hmm. for people to talk about um, the fact that there might be a problem in their home. And I don't think this addiction discriminates any family in New Jersey. We have Agreed. people, you know, you can see the consequences of untreated addiction uh, in, in, a, in a train station or it's hiding in a cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. Wealthiest somewhere. family, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Um, and, and, re and recovery is the same way. Recovery can be real. Um, for anybody and I think that to answer your question earlier about the importance of people speaking up mm -hmm. um, That's what I really work to do with the advocacy program in New Jersey Whether people are passionate about prevention overdose awareness recovery whether they're families of loss These people have a story that they can offer the, some of those solutions that we're talking about mm -hmm. um, Out there to the public because I think that it's not a common thing um, for people to just get empowered to talk about something like this because mm -hmm. there is a lot of shame, there's a lot of stigma that's associated with people that are struggling with addiction and people that have been in recovery for years. And have you been in recovery for? Yes, I'm a many? person in long-term recovery since September 6 of 2003. Um, and that, wow. so, you know, it's, so talking about young people in recovery, I, I don't <laughs> describe myself as young anymore, but I, I, found re I found recovery when I was a young person. Um, and I think that when I was young, I didn't know that there were recovery options out there. You and didn't. I, I, I had no clue. I, you know, I think that in New Jersey, we have collegiate recovery programs that are helping people maintain recovery at the college level, um, recovery high schools. There's recovery community support centers um, that are popping up in New Jersey that are community centers for people right. in recovery. I had no idea that any of that sort of thing existed when I was young and I think that that's part of the advocacy is the education and getting some of those sure. getting the awareness about I'm some of those. I'll, I'll, one second I'm uh -huh. gonna come back to that but I'm gonna give Joel a chance yeah um, <laughs> do, do you mind if we get a snapshot of your world before recovery began for you? sure sure I think uh, you know a couple of things I wanted to touch on that were mentioned already you know I think uh, it's a misconception people don't know that addiction is an illness it's kind of people think that it's just um, you know, people making bad choices. It's not. Uh, it's not a personal choice. It starts off as a personal choice, but once the progression of addiction really takes a hold, it's no when longer. When did you start for you? Uh, about thirteen. Hmm. I was thirteen, and uh, it was. You know, I'm, I like to to talk about. It. I'm from. I'm from East Brunswick, New Jersey. Very well endowed community. Very nice community. Blue ribbon schools. You know, I didn't have too much. You know, my my parents divorced when I was young, but that's the only thing that was like. You know, would make me a little bit more high risk to to fall accustomed to it. And, uh, you know, 
I, there was nothing really that bad. I'm not, you know, I, I feel I was not educated that much on addiction. I thought that it was an urban problem. I thought it was an inner city problem. I thought I had an image of what I thought someone with this illness looked like, homeless, living under a bridge, brown paper bag in their hand. You it know? wasn't you. No, no, it couldn't you, be me, what you did no matter what. Up. Do you mind me saying? No, go. And I won't if, if, no, if you don't. No, absolutely. You did start using at 13. Mm -hmm. It was pot, I, I imagine. Yep. And you wound up using heroin yeah. yeah, by the age of? It was later on, probably about 24, 24, okay. 23. I got into prescription pills, lasted about 18 months. Too expensive, not, not enough around, and, and it moved to heroin. Even though I knew better, I saw what it did to people, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. I was too sick, I was too much in the grip. Where does recovery begin for you and when? Uh, 26, 26 at the, at the end of my road, uh, beat up, um, a lot of probation, a lot of arrests, a lot of uh, different you know, drug charges, you know, mm -hmm. supporting my habit. And uh, finally, I had to go to a treatment facility. I had to go to rehab. Probation ordered me to go. And uh, I, f I was finally able to. I tried to get into some places in New Jersey. I wasn't able to. You know, there's a lot of issues with insurance and, and, and different facilities not, not being able to get in. You know, I, I wasn't able to, to get in. And I finally got into a place. And I just uh, took advantage of, of the opportunity. You know, I, I had needed to, to enter into recovery for a long time. I wanted to. How long has it been? I've been almost four years now. I've been in recovery. What does it feel like to be... First of all, congratulations. Thank you. And we wish you nothing but the best. Obviously, everyone does. Yeah. What is it like being in recovery for you every day? I, I, uh, it's, it's amazing. I didn't know that recovery was the, like the solution to my problem. You know, I didn't know that it was possible. I thought that um, you know, at a young age, I was kind of all in on, on a lifestyle, not knowing that I could change, you know, not, just thinking that this is the hand that I was dealt in life and this is how it's going to be for So you forever. really had no choice? Yeah, I didn't know that, that, I didn't know recovery was possible. I didn't know that I could change, you know. I, I didn't know that there was things I needed to focus on in my life, like the way I handle my emotions and feelings and the things that I do with myself, the, the people I surround myself with. I didn't know that I could change that stuff. I thought even if you remove the drugs from me, I would still be the same person. And I just, I didn't know, once that changed, once I, I came home from treatment and I started to surround myself with positive people in recovery and learned what I needed to do mm. to change the way that I lived, change the way that my, my brain received, like, the information around me, the things that were happening around me, the emotions and the family mm. stuff. You know, I, I learned how to change and how to just live life like normal people do and keep my, keep my addiction arrested and uh, just continue on, you know, and I do a lot of the same stuff <coughs> that Ariel touched on, you know, I'm a full-time student, straight A student, you know, right. I, I dropped out of school, I, you know, the last grade I ever passed was eighth grade, and, uh, you know, I'm a full-time, I'm pursuing a PhD in psychology, wow. you know, and uh, just a lot, a lot of stuff I've been able to, to do with my life once I, you know, got the help that I, I so desperately needed. What are the keys, unless I'm listening to you, and I'm sure you just, you have no idea you have a PhD in public broadcasting right now, and how many people <laughs> you just helped, you'd be surprised. Um, what are some of the keys to, I hate to use them environmental factors. I want to say this the right way, or ask it the right way. What are some of the pieces that need to be in place for the best possible, I know everyone's different. We'll jump in anyone here. Yeah. What are some of the keys to increasing the odds that someone will have the most successful recovery? First, and then jump in. Sure. Uh, I think there needs I'll come to back be, to you, I promise. <laughs> I, I, think there, I think there needs to be a whole cultural change. You know, if I can walk down Main Street, New Jersey, and see the liquor store with neon lights, uh, I should be able to walk down Main Street, New Jersey, and see a, a recovery community center or mm -hmm. go to a college that has a supportive program. You think sometimes you think going to college, it's a party atmosphere. Uh, why don't you give people another option, a place that they can? What does that mean? In their, you go, you in their go to recovery. a college campus and you see what? Well, I think that it's a, a, almost a hostile environment for people in recovery. College? <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's a, a, I think, hostile. I well, think you might be misunderstanding for, for, hostile. I don't. Right. I don't think college is a is a hostile environment. I think college can be an incredibly wondering and nurturing experience for many. However, what I for think Aaron's trying to say mm -hmm. is that there's a large alcohol and drug culture. Especially, I mean, think about kids That's who have well said. left, you know, left home for the first time. They're yes. on their own. Mm -hmm. They're excited. Um, 
they're drinking and they're getting high and for many it's harmless or maybe not harmless but for many it's it's not going to lead down the road for addiction but for someone like Aaron or Joel or myself who is at that point is maybe trying hanging on by a thread trying to to get just one more day of recovery um, there's a lot of temptation there's a lot of risk and what I think you meant yeah, by hostile good. is it's mm -hmm. hostile for someone in recovery well, what can that, that same do? What? situation happens for young people if you notice everyone talked about their start date and the age that they started is much younger than the college age so what about so, high school that's what I'm, you know so prevention links are my organization spent the last five years working on bringing a model to New Jersey, a high school for kids in recovery. Is that the Ray, the Ray Lesniak, Lesniak School in Spirit. Union County? Yes. Well, what, yeah. what goes on there that is different from another high school? It cre basically, we're creating an environment and a culture that's supportive of recovery. Describe that, please. Sure. So it's integrated <laughs> on, on site. We integrate recovery supports, meaning we have a recovery coach on site. We, um, Another member of young young people in recovery actually is there. We have uh, psychologists and clinical social workers on site, along with educators, and we have a whole wellness. We look at the whole child. So right in their day, they start their day by doing a recovery check-in with their recovery coach. How was your night? What's going on? Any stressors? Um, they throw they flow through their academic day, getting all of the education. But in, integrated in that is peer-to-peer uh, -peer group. There are professionally, they each have individual counseling. Um, so basically, the biggest component, though, is that all of their, um, st the student bodies in recovery. How many students? Right now, we, we have two. But, but think about what you just said. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I, I've got to believe there's a need. There's a huge need. <laughs> However, there are mm -hmm. two students. Well, we're brand new. We're, oh. we're new to the landscape. But, but here's what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. The economics of all this. People listening to you right now, there are a lot of people who are saying, okay, mm -hmm. on paper it makes sense. But how would one have such a school in their community and possibly pay for it? And who would pay for it? And would the tax dollars be there? Or is that the part of what you're saying about our cultural change that mm -hmm. we would care enough to... Well, like, I think the, the cost of untreated addiction is far exactly. greater than what... What does that mean? What, when, you, when you don't treat people and they're in communities that are either... Um, that if they're there's committing crimes, they're going to the ERs. There's jail um, costs about 40 grand plus a year, right? There's an impact on right? the health care yeah. system, yeah. on the juvenile justice system. You're paying you know, one way or the other. 20%, well, let me give you the statistics. Nationally, 80% of our kids that go back to their home school after treatment, 80% mm -hmm. of them drop out of school, do not graduate. At the recovery, in the recovery high school model, they're starting to realize results in the 90s, 90%, almost a flip, 90% graduation, no relapse, going on to college or mm -hmm. vocational Do you careers. think the demand's going to be greater for that Ray Lesniak school? Much greater. Absolutely. We already have. We're, we're getting calls all the time. We're just brand new. Not only are we a new school, we're a new model. Mm -hmm. We're a new model to the state. But the kids cannot be, are you saying kids can't be together here? Because you're in college right now. Yeah. But how are you dealing with the situation? Well, I don't live on campus. Okay. I go to a community college just where I don't stay on campus. Do you go there and get out of there? Mm -hmm. You do your coursework, school, just go to and get the library out of there. for a couple of hours. You know, I'm around uh, other students. You know, I engage with other students in, in my school, but I'm not, you know, going to parties or anything like that on, on a regular basis. We, the other thing we're doing is creating a culture, which is speaks to a little bit of what you were yeah. asking earlier. Yeah, describe we're it. creating a culture that's drug free for teens. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult for teens to make it through their adolescence without you know, getting involved, at least at experimenting, and if they're at risk anywhere with alcohol and drugs. Creating a drug-free culture for teens. Correct. They what can we do as parents to promote that? Uh, well, you can get involved in your community and speaking to some of the things that Aaron was talking about, creating a community that has a drug-free culture, mm -hmm. re reducing the number of liquor stores that are available, um, promoting legislation and ordinances that also reduce the number of... Um, Outlets that you know children have access to helping. Not to mention with parties that go on in people's communities. We have where, in people's houses. You know, yeah, I was just going to talk about this. Home. I know of. Listen, we know parents who we know. You you know, we know who each other are. There are some parents who are like who have often said, "At least I know it's going on in my home, in our home." Yeah. And you're shaking your head. And it doesn't it doesn't make it right. 
You know, there's a reason that you know the the drinking age is 21. It's not because it's a, it's a moral thing. It's because of the developments in the brain and the body that are happening. You know, same thing with cigarettes. There's serious um, ramifications, serious problems that come from underage drinking. You know, and God forbid, you know, if a parent something happens at a house where where kids are drinking, if kids get into a fight or anything like that, the parents will be responsible. But I mean, really, that's the main thing. It's not like people just said, hey, how can we mess up some kids' lives? So let's make the drinking age 21. No, there's scientific facts. <laughs> but are you throwing you're that. throwing drinking in though with drugs though? So yes. there's two things. You're so, saying yes. Yeah. Are they? Yeah, it's I, the, I yeah. think that the, uh, both alcohol Alcohol's and drug. and and drugs are something that people uh, can abuse. I think it's, it's all one and the same thing. You know, my story uh, started with alcohol mm -hmm. and too. it led to drugs. So it's not Here's so. Too. Some people can socially. M my dad can have a glass of wine at night and he's fine. I'm but not, someone I'm not, I'm not wired like that. I, you know, I think that, right. um, well, especially when we're talking about young people, when their brains are still developing, they're still they're dealing with uh, dealing with yeah. peers and environment. Those are all things that contribute to um, to people's path. You know, like when people are still kind of growing. I didn't find recovery till the age of 22, but I did more growing since the age of 22 to <laughs> 33 than I did the prior to tw 22 years before that. You know, and I think that when we're introducing recovery to people at a young age, at least it's, it's an option and that it's a real option. We have to keep doing that, don't we? we, we and the schools have, have to, to be involved in this as well, don't absolutely. they? Yep. The landscape absolutely. has changed. Um, you know, when you talk about underage drinking, you're introducing a, you know, risk-taking behavior. You're starting to, the child is entering into a domain of risk-taking behavior. When you look at heroin, the epidemic of heroin right now, the landscape has changed. Parents don't have time anymore to take the attitude that, well, at least they're in my house. This is that a won't cut it. rapid, right. rapid progression down that path. And so we don't have the luxury. Let me just switch gears here. Part of the recovery um, process and the culture that we're trying to change, I imagine has to do with stigma. Yeah. Can we talk about stigma? Sure. Um, well, I mean, of addiction. and I think we've touched already so much on kind of the consequences of stigma, you know, like, so for example, my mom had breast cancer several years ago. She's now currently in remission. There was no shame that surrounded that, you she know, didn't do anything. Um, to she that. didn't do anything to cause her cancer. Um, but, you know, so there was no hesitance to tell people that she was suffering. Or when I moved from Florida and came to live with her and take care of her, there was no, like, hush-hush about what I was going to do or, or where I was going or why I was doing it. Whereas when we deal with addiction, and if we look at addiction as the chronic health condition that it is, there's all this hush-hush, there's all this quietness, there's all this denial, and there's all this shame because culturally we don't look at addiction as a health issue. We look at it as a moral failure. Failing, as a, a personal issue. choice right. and as a Don't criminal issue. Don't we ask you in a job application, and if I'm wrong, you'll correct me, you're applying for a job. Mm -hmm. And you are asked the question if you've ever been committed of a felon, uh, convicted of a crime. crime. Yep. Yeah. And if... Changed. It just it changed. changed. Actually, Actually I'm like so excited. Is I didn't it wanna... Ban the Box? Is that yeah. what we're yes. talking about? I didn't so want to cut you off. Who wants to talk about Ban the Box? Probably all of us. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about it. So ban the box is legislation that actually the advocates in New Jersey did a lot of advocacy about. Um, part of this is about stigma too, and it's also a practical. Absolutely, with so stigma. Ahead. And um, so what ban the box is is that box that you're talking about on the application. When I go for an interview, I go to ask Aaron for a job, and on the interview. Uh, before I get to the interview, the application has a box that says, have you been convicted of a felony in the past seven years? So Joel and I both go, and Joel's not a felon, and I am. Even if I'm a better qualified candidate, an employer is going to throw my application out due to He's what comes with, yeah. with someone who's a criminal. So ban the box does not imply... But that felony, if it relates to drug use, would have been be an argument in this argument is because you were addicted yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And, and that's so what you much argue my is story. a health, yeah. health issue comparable to what you're saying your mom had experienced as opposed to a criminal who's wantingly going out there committing a crime to hurt someone else. And so what this does is it doesn't say that I never need to tell my future employer okay. that I mm -hmm. have a felony conviction. It's not implying or, or saying that I should conceal that. It's just saying I, I don't need to tell them that before I get in the door. And then you have no shot at getting um, in the door. Because I won't get in the door. Field for applicants. A few seconds left. To compete yeah. at. Anything else about addiction that we haven't covered that we should cover in the yeah. next show? Um, I think that it's really important what Marielle touched on, the fact that you think about uh, cancer was highly stigmatized 
stigmatized before people understood mm. it. HIV and AIDS 20 years ago, highly stigmatized. It's the same thing mm -hmm. with addiction right now. And I think that when you look at historically when that changed, when those when start we started to get positive changes, it's because people started speaking out and talking about their experiences and educating people about the health condition. We just need to and change we need more the face people of recovery. To do that. We well, need to change the face of recovery. Mm -hmm. We need to take chances on innovative programming like the one we're doing in Union <laughs> County and to provide an opportunity for our kids well, to Well, the three of you have helped change the face and you have helped us with your expertise and I promise you this will not be the last program we do on this very important subject. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chess Challenge, Steve and Elaine Pozicki, Cone Resnick, Fedway Associates. University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, the Ollendorf Center, and by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Imagine you're enjoying your child's baseball game. As hard as it is to believe, one of the nine children on the field may be abusing prescription drugs and getting them right out of your family's medicine chest. Join the American Medicine Chest Challenge by taking inventory and securing your medicine, safely disposing of your unwanted and expired medicine, and finally, talk to your kids. Visit AmericanMedicineChest.com to find out how.